It's the Cybrick Podcast. My name is David J. Dickman. That's also my Twitter handle. And thank you for watching the Cybrick YouTube channel. With me today, oh, by the way, uh, if you could just hit that subscribe button. Thank you. Uh, with me today is Howard Bloom. And I already have a smile on my face just based off the little amount that we just chatted uh, off, off mic, off camera. How are you today, sir? And where are you today? Uh, I'm in Park Slope, Brooklyn. It is a wonderful day. David, I just came in from an hour walk in the park. There's a 480-acre park near my home. You should see what spring is doing in New York right now. It's I have never been the there. trees with green and, and pink and white. And you guys had a crazy harsh winter too, right? Uh, yes. Well, we had some snow. Yes. <laughs> Just some. But, it, but well, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, oh, so okay. uh, snow five feet deep is nothing in Buffalo. But here, any snow is a catastrophe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I definitely get it. Well, listen, you're you're a well-traveled man. You have a lot of projects to go going on at the same time. You... I guess your time management skills just baffle me. I'm really, really curious about it. But what is the one project that you're working on currently that you just can't stop thinking about? Oh, my God. I have to think about all of them. So <laughs> uh, so I'm right now I've got to write a keynote speech for the Asia Space Technology Summit because I'm the co-founder of that summit and um, and I'm the chairman of the summit. And it's happening in Malaysia, I think, the 10th through 11th of May, which is right around the corner. Meantime, I've got this project called Garden the Solar System Green the Galaxy. And it is a visual manifesto for the future of life and the future of the, co the cosmos. And um, it's been adopted as uh, the official vision of the National Space Society. And there's a film, a documentary coming out about me called Surf the Catastrophe. And I have to coordinate that. I you mean, know, I've, I've got this current book out which is incredibly relevant, but incredibly hard to break through. It's called the Muhammad Code, how a desert prophet brought you ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Boko Haram, or how Muhammad invented jihad. And everybody who's read it says that it's astonishing and it's the best research book. They don't even say it's the best research book on Islam they've ever read. They say it's the best research book they've ever read. It's wow. uh, 1,930 footnotes, and a lot of those footnotes have five citations. So... And it's a very, very important book in today's world. And then I have another book called How I Accidentally Started the 60s coming out around July or August. And that book, <laughs> the first the first draft, um, Timothy Leary called it a monumental masterpiece of American literature filled with wow, woo, and aha experiences, nonstop scientific comedy routines. And he compared it to the works of James Joyce. So and there's a lot of other stuff happening all at the same time. So I got to coordinate all these things. The real trick is to pull these things together and make them increase each other's powers. Well, for another time, we're going to touch on how the hell you manage your schedule and your productivity and how you manage to sleep and how you manage to to do everything. But for right now, uh, I've, I'm fascinated by the timing of this book was did you did you nail this book down how long did it take you to write it uh, about 40 years um, actually I started to sit down and really compile the book in 2003 I finished the first version in 2005 or so um, no publisher would touch it it's explosive yeah. people are afraid that if they sign this book they're gonna have their throat slit or their offices bombed mm. so um, finally, a publisher picked up on it this year, and uh, I spent three months doing a radical update and upgrade. But the fact is, I've been tracking militant Islam for a long time. My first book, The Lucifer Principle, talks about it and has been, has been spoken of as the book that predicted 9-11. Um, it talks about, this is a book that was written in 1990, or published in 1995. It talks about the danger of a nuclear Iran. Does that sound at all topical yeah, right now? It sounds a little newsy. Yeah. <laughs> so this book, 20 years later, is still selling strong because it reads as if it was written yesterday. Then my second book, Global Brain, The Evolution of Mass Mind from the Big Bang to the 21st Century, had a chapter saying there are a couple of people we should be keeping our eyes on. Remember, this is 2000, 2000 this book came out. And um, it talked about a guy named Osama bin Laden and a group called the Taliban. Um, 
And then guess what happened on 9-11, 2000 and whatever it was, 2001. Right. Um, so that book was also called the book that predicted 9-11. And somehow the, the war with militant Islam, the war is not with Islam. The war is with militant Islam, with jihadist Islam, with a certain interpretation of Islam. That war has been going on for 1,400 years. So it doesn't matter when you write about it. It's always going to be topical. Right, right. There's a, a, a distinction that we should know here that Cybrink does not land itself anywhere on the spectrum of religion, just really concerns itself on science and technology. I personally am going to read your book, and I also personally just want to know for selfish reasons if you're a fan of Sam Harris. Um, no, but we, we have exchanged a couple of emails. Oh. Uh, Sam Harris has landed very late on a territory I was in a long time ago, and us authors are competitive, oh, and okay. that includes me and Sam, but we are in touch. Oh, okay. Um, and I'm a fan of what he's doing right yeah. now, but I don't really direct. I mean, I see the headlines, so I'm on his mailing list. But let me go back to science for a second. Yeah, please do. So you could you could wonder what in the world does the Muhammad Code have to do with science? Well, look, I started in science at the age of 10 in theoretical physics and microbiology. I know that sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> but like you, you were kicked kicked around as a kid. Um, you were a nerd. Well, so was I. Um, so I just dove into this stuff and loved it. And then at the age of 13, I suddenly realized if I'm going to use these tools of science that I've now spent a quarter of my life learning, the most fab, one of the most fascinating things to use them on is the mass emotions yeah. that are swept together in tidal waves by people like Adolf Hitler, by the so-called great men of history. How in the world does that work? How do we see that through a scientific lens? Well, that's what led to the Muhammad Code in the long run. This is not just your standard book of here's, here's how a monstrous man named Muhammad founded a religion. This is a book about how history works, about the underlying forces of history. When the subtitle of my first book, The Loser Principle, is a scientific expedition into the forces of history. And I've been scientifically expeditioning into the forces of history um, my whole, ever since I was 13 years old, to the best of my abilities. I want to take a pivot really quick because we touched on it in just a little bit. Uh, but as far as technology is concerned, we are just in this hyperbolic, giant growth curve. And it's just so recent. But as far as socially, we're kind of the same. Like we haven't really progressed. Well, yeah, that's, I'm glad you observed that. And let me just use a Kleenex for a second here. But, I mean, this is an unsightly thing to do on video. Nonetheless, okay, we got away with it. Um, you're absolutely right. It's absolutely bizarre. Around, uh, well, you know, the Roman Empire fell around 500 AD. And the living standard of everybody in Europe plunged dramatically. Half the population of Europe died of plague and starvation. Um and Europe didn't get back up to the level of the Roman Empire until 1776, the year of our revolution and our declaration of independence. America! And, Woo! But, Sorry. Yeah, but then about 1815, which is only 40 years later, all of a sudden the technological growth curve began. Mm. And we invented the rail, the steam engine, the railroad, um, the telegraph the telephone, the typewriter, the file cabinet, which actually totally changed the way that we do information retrieval, mm. information storage and retrieval. And then in the 20th century, the pace picked up even further, the jet plane, the plane to begin with, and all kinds of other things. And now, the, back in the 1800s, these, magic, ma these massive technological upheavals were taking place every 15 years. Today, they're taking place every five years or less. But you're absolutely right. When we read the works of Plato, we are absolutely convinced that his human nature was precisely the same as our human nature. And yet it couldn't have been because we have so many tools that have extended our powers that he didn't have that it's ridiculous. And yet there is this stubbornness of the nature of human nature, of our belief that human nature remains unchanged. It's like a gyroscopic stabilizing system. Mm or the wheels on your bicycle that just won't let you fall over once you get up to a certain speed. And I've never figured out an adequate phrase for it, this stubbornness of human nature. Um, 
but it's a yeah you're absolutely right it's a very important phenomenon and it's weird i mean look at you and me right now i have a computer that weighs three pounds sitting on my lap it comes complete with a video camera so i'm and i have these tiny little earbuds look in the 1950s and 1960s when hi-fi was invented the big status symbol of the time was to get giant speakers the size of refrigerators. That was how you showed your manliness. Well, look at us. We have speakers the equivalent of those. Mine are earbuds. Yours wrap around your head. They're a little bit bigger, but they're certainly not the size of refrigerators. Everything has changed dramatically. If you walked down the street in 1960, um, you were bored shitless <laughs> because... Because you had nothing to do. All you could do was look at the scenery and maybe nod every once in a while when you pass somebody who was familiar. Um, it was boring. Today, you can walk down the street either listening to podcasts, listening to music, um, or talking to a friend in Beijing on the telephone. Yes. That's an astonishing change in human nature. Nature works for up to 100 million years to make changes of this size in biological creatures. We're making these changes every five years. It's fucking astonishing. I mean, I hope I can get away with all this language on this podcast. Fuck but, yeah, you can. Whatever. Yes. Well, I'll let you yes. roll with it. Let's roll yeah. with it. It's kind of, it is, it's what a crazy thing. And the, the, the notion that, you know, that humans may not have existed had that asteroid that, smashed into earth that made the earth ring for a million years and uh, and eliminate the dinosaurs uh our, uh the, i heard the argument that humans may not have existed had that asteroid just just nicked into something else so the gravity pulled in a different way so it just missed earth barely and then we wouldn't have been here and earth would have been completely well, freaking could, different well that could easily be but we don't really understand to what extent life is inevitable and to what extent life is an accident um, we don't understand how life began. We don't understand how mega molecules pulled themselves together and then began to assemble other meta mega molecules. We really don't understand it yet. And we don't understand how the first cells came to be. And we don't understand yet. I mean, there's this, I did a piece for a magazine called Physical Plus. It's a physics magazine um, a long time ago called the Xerox Effect. And it points out that there's this thing in this cosmos call, that I call super simultaneity, super synchrony. Um, it, you've got the very beginning of the universe and there's a big bang, right? And this weird stuff that has never, ever existed before called time, space, and speed. Three things, time, space, and speed come unfolding. This, this manifold, this sheet, this self-expanding sheet comes rushing from the nothingness at a tremendous speed, expanding in ways that we can't even comprehend with time, space, and speed. What the hell are time, space, and speed? Where the hell did they come from? And then within the first 10 to the minus 30 seconds of a second, the first sliver of a sliver of a sliver of a second. Hmm. Let's imagine you and I are sitting at a coffee table at the beginning of the universe, and I am the crusty old fart, and you are the imaginative guy. And we've been sitting around forever. I mean, the number of coffee cups we've been through is beyond belief. Our bill, when it comes, is going to be humongous. And you predict that all of a sudden there's going to be a pinprick smaller than a pinprick, and it's going to come bursting out of the nothingness, and it's going to expand at super speed. And i got to say, David, look, you know how long we've been sitting here, and there, there's never been a pinprick. A pinprick has never existed. There's never been such a thing as expansion. There's never been time, space, and speed. You must have absorbed mescaline with your last cup of coffee. This is, I mean, this is just plain false. And a second later, wham, there comes the pinprick smaller than a pinprick. And then you do another wacky thing. You say, see that expanding sheet of time, space, and speed expanding like a handkerchief blown on by a giant that then becomes as big as, well, the cosmos. Um, I predict that time, space, and speed any second now are going to precipitate the way that raindrops precipitate from a cloud, and they're going to precipitate in the very first things. And i got to explain to you. Look let's, look, let's look at Aristotelian logic, David. Garbage in, garbage out. A plus A equals two A's. A plus so time, space, and speed equals time, space, and speed. That's all you're going to get out of time, space, and speed. 
and wham, like a blizzard, the very first things come yanking themselves, lifting themselves from time, space, and speed, and they are the very first things. They are the very first things, and those things come in only 16 different forms, which means this is not a six monkeys and six typewriters universe, because for each of those 16 million basic types, there are a gazillion of identical copies. A gazillion of identical copies, all given birth to at the very same instant. That's super synchrony. That's super simultaneity. And the formation of atoms takes place with super synchrony and super simultaneity. No matter where you are in the cosmos, atoms form at approximately the same time and are exactly the same. Um, no matter where you are in the cosmos, uh, another billion years down the line, galaxies form. And within them, stars form. And around those, planets form, no matter where you are. And they all form at approximately the same time. So it makes sense to imagine that life, mega molecules capable of making other mega molecules and cells, that they all came into existence at approximately the same time in approximately the same way, no matter where you were in the cosmos, where there were the sufficient conditions to harbor life. So on the basis of this way of viewing things, hey, life has to be all over the place and maybe human beings are all over the place. Maybe some variation on human or consciousness and cumulative multi-generational mind, because that's what we humans are really good at, is accumulating a culture. That's something birds don't do, chimpanzees don't do. Yes, they have cultural elements, but it's not this massive accumulation that we create. But you would imagine that, some, that consciousness and this massive multicultural accumulation of invention is going on not just here, but is going on someplace else. However, David, I'm a skeptic. We have no evidence for it going on anywhere. When my friend Peter Gerritsen became the head of the Future Science and Technology Branch of the Air Force, he's a lieutenant colonel, he was given permission by his position to check into absolutely anything that roused his curiosity. Huh. And one of the first things he did was go to area, whatever it's called. 51. Uh, yeah, area 51. And to see if, in fact, we had any evidence of aliens. No evidence. At least he concluded that there was no evidence. I mean, one of the people who supported me, will get me more at the center of the frame. One of the people who supported me in the space community was Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man on the moon. And Edgar had this feeling that he had seen or sense the possibility of aliens. Um, whoops, we have a background noise. Can you hear it? I can't, no. Oh, good. Well, okay, so it's going away. So at any rate, it was the aliens checking up on us. Um, <laughs> so they don't like this conversation. As soon but, as you brought but, up the moon, you know. Right. So I know that Edgar felt this way. It showed up in headlines periodically, but I didn't want to embarrass him. And we were talking about serious space topics, so I never brought it up with him. But I seriously doubt that we have any evidence of the existence of aliens anywhere in the planet. Look how hard the SETI project has been working. Since in 1981, Carl Sagan wanted to get money together to check for aliens, to look for radio signals from aliens. I knew that he wanted money, and I was working with Earth, Wind, and Fire. And when I went through all of Earth, Wind, and Fire's stuff, the biggest, the biggest clue to what Maurice White, who was Earth, Wind, and Fire, had in his mind was his album covers. And so we sat down for lunch, and I said, Maurice, Tell me if I'm wrong. I get the impression from your album covers that you feel that aliens from another galaxy landed on this planet 11,000 years ago, built the pyramids, or taught us how to build the pyramids, and embedded in the pyramids all the wisdom that we've used since then to develop culture. And Maurice smiled and said, yes. And I said, okay, I have an idea for you. There's this guy named Carl Sagan, an astronomer, and he wants to get together the money to look for aliens. Um, so why don't we do an Earth, Wind & Fire benefit concert for Carl Sagan? And Maurice was all for it. And I tracked down Carl Sagan at his summer home and got his home number and arranged to put him on the phone with, with Maurice White. And the minute that Carl Sagan got a whiff of what was on Maurice's mind, aliens from another galaxy planting the pyramids here on Earth, he was over and out. He didn't have the... <laughs> 
as crazy as his ideas were, he didn't have the tolerance to put up with Maurice's ideas. No, so, I read Carl Sagan's book. I had to put it down because I'm too dumb to understand it, but I got the general oh. sense of he was a no-nonsense kind of guy. Well, he was. he wrote brilliant essays. And his son, Dorian Sagan, is a friend of mine, and his first wife, Lynn Margulis, one of the most important biologists of the last hundred years, was a mentored me. She was mm. absolutely terrific. But and and Dorian is fabulous. His writing is just amazing. Pick up one of his books sometime; you'll be astonished. The Cosmic Tinkerer, I think, is the name of the latest one, and I was blown away by it. So, but at any rate, that was 1981. Well, how many years has it been since 1981? Um, 30, 36. Five years, 36 years. That's a long time. Have we found any signals from alien intelligences, intelligences despite putting together large amounts of money and having huge telescopes, spending lots of time working on this problem? No, this, uh, there, it, the pro that project has been such a failure. But the SETI Institute now calls itself the Organization for the Study of Life in the Universe. It doesn't talk about aliens anymore. They do a weekly podcast, The Big Picture. Seth Shostak, who's just fabulous, I was on a panel with him two years ago, um, does it. And But no, they don't talk about aliens anymore. They, they, they haven't given up, but they're just not talking about it because they found nothing, absolutely nothing. So from the point of view of super simultaneity and super synchrony and the Xerox effect, the same things happening pretty much at the same time all over the universe in exactly the same way or almost exactly the same way. From that point of view, hell, there must be human beings or something the equivalent all over this bloody universe. Do we have any evidence that there is or are not on your life? Now, is there something, I, I don't know a better word to say it, but something wonky that you believe like, I don't know if you've ever taken an, an acid trip or something, but you created the yes, 60s. Yes, I, like I remember I helped create the 60s. So <laughs> so, I did. Don't you think like we're connected by some weird way that we just don't understand that science, that we just don't have either the language, the technology, language is a technology, but we just don't have the technology to to bring forth the evidence or just – do you know what I'm trying to say right there? Yeah, I, it's absolutely. So, it's so hard to uh, say. I'm a, I'm a real skeptic about things like uh, telepathy, telekinesis, but somehow we do manage to do things as a group. For example, when in 2001 we had uh, the 9-11, uh, we had the World Trade Center attacks, which I watched from my roof, Ooh. which is pretty horrifying. And I was stuck in bed in those days. I had a 15-year-long illness. Oh, and people, and then we had the crash of Enron and WorldCom and a bunch of major corporations. And we were having a major crisis of confidence in a major, in, in American civilization. And a bunch of people started coming over to my house, visiting me, and they would walk in the door. And the first thing they'd say is American civilization is dying and it deserves to die. It's the most violent civilization in the history of mankind. Or Western civilization civilization is dying and it deserves to die. It's the most violent civilization in the history of mankind. These were intellectuals. These were people who should be up on their facts. Now, in my book, The Lucifer Principle, and later in Steven Pinker's book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, we chased down the facts. I did it in a page. Stephen Pinker did it in 600 pages. And the fact is that if you were born in 1650, you had 10 times the odds of dying a violent death at the hands of a fellow human being, 10 times the chances of dying violently mm. as you have today. Meaning the factor of peace in the world, specifically in Western civilization, the civilization that these intellectual friends of mine were calling the most violent in the history of mankind, the factor of peace in Western civilization had gone up by a factor of 10, had been multiplied by 10. That's an astonishing achievement. And yet we didn't know we did it, which means we have no clue as to how we did it. And that's something pulled off without telepathy, but with some larger crowd power of a kind that we haven't quite grokked, haven't quite understood. Now, my book, Global Brain, is really about that. It says that in the same way that 100 billion neurons, all capable of living independently, come together in your brain and form a collect. I mean, each one has only this tiniest sliver of intelligence. And yet you put those, it, 
tiny slivers together and you get you and me. And the thinking we're doing right now as we're thinking out the issues that we want to discuss, that's pretty damn astonishing. Yeah. And you get the fact that this is going to be poured in to the larger sea of humanity via the internet. And hopefully we'll get some hits. Um, so at any rate, uh, so there is something larger in which we participate. But I think that we are like neurons in that brain and that we are parts of a higher identity that we can't see. And that the higher identity is the identity of our social group. Now, of course, we're in 15 different social groups simultaneously. Our subculture, um, our hobby clubs, uh, our friends on the Internet, our friends in person, um, our political party, the United States. The United States is part of a larger global structure. Um, so, but the brain is like that too. I mean, just try um, deciding that you want to lose five pounds and walking past a chocolate bar. You'll find your mind at war with itself. Part of your mind is going to absolutely want that chocolate bar. And part of your mind is going to say absolutely no. And the two are going to fight it out right inside you the way the Democrats and Republicans fight it out in this larger collective identity called the United States. So that's the bloom thesis. And that's why the book is called Global Brain, because you put us all together and, and this planet started operating as a global brain with massive global information exchange three and a half billion years ago when bacteria were sending out messages, little packets of new things that they had invented called DNA and picking up other packets of DNA ah, from other bacterial cultures. So yes, there is something larger and there are mysteries, and in the same way that until relatively recently, we didn't know infrared light existed, until 16, roughly 1680, we didn't know that microorganisms existed, and yet we've been sharing a planet with them ever since we'd been human 200,000 years ago. There are many things that we can't detect yet that we'll discover, but I don't think they'll be like telepathy. I'll think they'll be like, the, like what you call group thing, our ability to influence each other. I am fascinated with the idea of everything being fractal. That uh, I used just, to read my book, The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates. <laughs> I, I'm fascinated by it because humans are basically a, a giant donut, and one of the holes is the one we talk out of, and the other one yes, is a, a torus, you, you get it. it's called. So, yeah, so, I mean, we have microorganisms in her stomach and the gastro, the, like the GI tract is fascinating now. And there's a lot of science coming out about gut health and gut bacteria. And just as if we have a population in our gut, there's, there are more E. coli bacteria in her stomach than there are people in the world now. And that is fascinating, right? And well, then, in fact, there, in just one colony of bacteria, I mean, you've got tons of colonies in you. Just one colony the size of your palm would be so thin that you couldn't see it. And yet it would contain 7 trillion bacteria, which is more than all the human beings who've ever lived. Just in that one colony. Jesus. And you've got tons of these colonies. You've got them garrisoning your nose in order to fend off foreign invaders. Yep. You've got them garrisoning your throat, again, in order to fend off invaders that wish you harm. Uh, you've got them in your gut making vitamin B, vitamin K, um, things you can't make without them. When you go down to the local store and buy some chocolate eclairs, take them home and eat them, you just acted as a, uh, a transport and shopping machine for bacteria because you can't digest those chocolate eclairs. Yes, you chew them. Yes, you send them down your esophagus, but then it's the bacteria who actually digest them. And it's what the bacteria excrete, glucose, that's your food. So you are acting as a giant transport mechanism and shopping machine for bacteria. So if humans are the bacteria in this fractal example, what are we excreting? Is it technology? Is it AI? It's information. It's inf uh -huh. information and emotion. Um, uh -huh. You and I are doing it right. Look, what do human beings need more than anything else in the world? Chocolate attention. attention. No, attention <laughs> is the oxygen. Attention is the oxygen of the human soul. Correct. And what and what does attention allow us to do? To influence others. If we mm. can get their attention, we can influence them. 
So we're only alive to the extent that we're influencing our fellow human beings. We're only alive to the extent that we're exchanging something with our fellow human beings. And it's the exchange of that something, whether it's information or emotion or whatever, that that's our daily activity. If you go for a full day without any attention from any other human on the face of planet Earth, you will end up depressed. I.e. solitary confinement. Yeah, exactly. Which I experienced during those years when I was stuck in this bed because for five years I was too weak to talk or too weak to have another person in the room with me. And believe me, solitary confinement is a torture unlike anything you've ever imagined. The pains that, con- that your own system generates to torture you in solitary confinement, there are no words for them. That's how weird and strange and awful they are. So yes, b- bacteria are very social. Again, they live in these cities of seven trillion, these colonies of seven trillion. But one bacteria doesn't get motivated unless it rubs up against another bacteria. Does that sound anything like you and me? Yeah, rub Does up on my wife. Anything- <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so even bacteria need to communicate. They're built so that they, they can't get away without communicating. If they try to get away without communicating, they're killing themselves off. And so are we. Huh. Even, you know, there are people like my first wife's father, who he at least pretended that he could go into the forest for five years with just a jackknife and he could live perfectly happy, happily with, without other human beings. What the hell is he talking about? Who does he think made the shoes that he's walking in? Who does he think invented all of the micro technologies, the sole of the shoe, the rubber of the shoe, the the laces of the shoe, the leather making processes that go into the shoe? That's other human beings. He could walk in totally naked. And who made his knife? Um, That knife was evolved over 200, no, over 2.5 million years of human tool making. He is carrying the product of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of human beings when he thinks he's alone in that forest with just shoes, no clothes, and a knife. Yeah, it's not all his proprietary technology. It's all, right, it's, exactly. it's, a, it's a whole lineage of it. You know, I'm, I'm really fascinated at what you, I'm fascinated by this subject, and I'm really curious, what is your stance? What do you think is going to happen? What's a place of humans in the cosmos from here forward? Well, the cosmos is a massive invention machine. That first burp of the Big Bang, that was radical innovation. I call it the supersized surprise. And the cosmos is a place of supersized surprises. Remember you predicted that space, time, and speed would precipitate the way that raindrops precipitate from a cloud into the very first things. And I would have told you, David, there's a reason we call this the nothing. No thing. Get it? Mm -hmm. Those first things were a radical innovation. And, And innovation is an inadequate word for it because these are not just game changers. These are cosmos changers. Um, And the first things getting together in atoms, another unbelievable astonishment. So this is a universe of supersized astonishments. What do you think our role is? Coming up with the next bunch of supersized astonishments, supersized surprises. But is this unnatural? We think it is. We're crazy. The universe has been doing this since the very beginning. Change on an extraordinary, totally transformational level has been the cosmos game for 13.73 billion years. So when we create massive disruption, we're not doing something unnatural, we're doing nature's work. When we dream of things, even when we dream of things like peace and justice, we've been dreaming about that for at least 2,500 years. Hell, you can trace that dream to chimpanzees. When a new alpha male takes over in a chimpanzee troop, he's been a bully up until then. That's how he's gotten to the top. He has to immediately shift gears. He has to immediately uphold the poor and the oppressed. If there's a battle between a weakling and a powerful male, he has to step in on behalf of the weakling. If he doesn't understand that, he's out. He'll be voted out of his alpha position within days or weeks um, because there is the equivalent of voting in chimpanzee tribes. That's the beginning of truth, justice, and peace. Mm. And... We dream of it because not because we've invented it, because nature put it in our dreams. Well, why does nature put things in our dreams? 
to turn fantasies into disruptive, radical, astonishing new realities. So we are the, new, the creators of new realities, and creating new realities is what nature is all about. So we are doing nature's work. We are her eyes, we are, are her ears, and we are her imagineers and her breakthrough makers. So creativity stems from what then? Creativity stems from we don't know what. It's inherent in the cosmos. Um, I, I have a debate coming up on Sunday about entropy. Entropy is the idea, you know, this, the second law <laughs> of thermodynamics. Oh, I can't even show you. Oh, amazing. It's, it says uh, embrace the chaos is what it oh, means. Oh, neat, neat, neat. Which is okay. entropy, right? Right. So the basic idea behind entropy is that entropy is on a constant increase in the universe, which means disorder is on a constant increase. Just melting down to a, a random soup is what's on a constant increase in the cosmos. I'm sorry, I've put together a timeline of this cosmos. I've been doing it since I was 12 years old, building it. And there is no place on that timeline where you find entropy taking over. Even when horrible things happen in the universe, even when terrible acts of dissolution happen, like the death of the first stars, remember, those first stars were a radical innovation, a supersized surprise. And so was their death. And you would think, aha, death of stars, that proves entropy, doesn't it? No, not at all. Because the first stars, the first generation of stars, only had three different kinds of atoms, hydrogen, helium, and lithium. That's all the universe had invented. And believe me, those were big inventions, just as stars were. But in the process of dying, there was not only a massive light show around a supernova, there was a huge crunch in the supernova's heart. And that huge crunch drove the nuclei of hydrogen, helium, and lithium atoms together and in the process created 89 new forms of atoms, 89 new elements this cosmos had never seen before. That's from an entropic event, the death of a star. So where is the entropy? It's, entropy is dead wrong. Entropy says everything is slumping to exhaustion. No, everything is climbing. Everything is constantly climbing to the next rung of the supersized surprise. It's fascinating. That's so crazy to think about it that way. Now, when you say that it's going to come raining, uh, precipitating down, my monkey brain can't grasp that. Can you help dumb it down for me? Well, it's like uh, the best example I've been able to think of. I mean, you know, a cloud is floating in the sky and it's a vapor, right? Or it wouldn't stay up there. Right. Um, and, um, and then if you follow a cloud, you know, if you decide to take a blimp ride and just follow a cloud around, Eventually, if you pick the right cloud, that cloud will grow dark and and drops will precipitate from a vapor. Well, in the same way that drops precipitate from a vapor, um, things, they're called quarks and leptons, precipitate from that massive spreading sheet of space and time, that expansive, ex rapidly expanding space-time manifold. Does that make any sense? I'm too dumb. I don't get it. I, I mean, I still, uh, oh no, I still I struggle to... with uh, string theory and all that, but that's great because if I have the, the lowest of the lowest baseline, then everyone watching this will definitely get it, feel smarter. So, Well, you, but you were, you were really good at math <laughs> once upon a time So when you were a kid. Um, so I, I don't know how to put it more clearly than that. I, obviously, if i do not not getting it across, I, look. You know, when I was 12 years old, I'd been in science by that time for two years. Well, two years when you're 12 years old is a real long time. Yeah. And I and a girl in class, because I was like you, I was picked on and, and, and nobody ever made eye contact with me. They called me the sickly scientist, but that was about the only recognition of my existence that they gave. So one day in eighth grade, one of the girls who hated me the most suddenly swiveled her eyes to me and made eye contact. And David, it had never happened to me before. Mm. And she said, and you said, the mere fact that she was talking to me was utterly flabbergasting. And she said, I told my mom that you understand the theory of relativity. Now, look, the only thing I had going for me was my immersion in science at the time. So I couldn't admit the truth that, no, I didn't understand the theory of relativity. So as soon as school got out, I got on my bicycle and I drove to the local library where the librarians literally knew me better than my mother did and said, give me everything you've got on relativity. And they gave me a big fat book by Einstein and two collaborators and a little skinny book by Einstein all, all on his own. 
And I don't know why, but, but at that point in my life and probably for the rest of it too, I always took on the hard thing, not the easy thing. So when I got home, I, I went in, I dove into the big fat book and the big fat book would have about nine words of English at the top of the page. The rest of the page would be equations and then another nine words of English at the bottom. I don't understand equations. I never have, mm. despite the fact that my book, The God Problem, gives a history of math, but in terms of stuff you could understand and enjoy. <laughs> um, that, that's the benefit of being a person who has to understand it in a way that you can understand and enjoy. So at any rate, I didn't understand any of the equations, and uh, it got to be 8 o'clock at night. I've been doing this now for four hours. And I'd only gotten to page 50. And I realized that my mom's going to put me to bed at, at 10 o'clock. And if I don't understand the theory of relativity by 10 o'clock, I'm, I'm screwed. Um, I'm going to have to face that girl the next day and confess that I don't understand the theory of relativity. So I turned to the little skinny book that was written by Einstein alone. And Einstein, it, every once in a while, a book feels like the author is grabbing you by the lapels and putting his nose up to yours and giving you a personal message. Well, Albert Einstein, in the introduction to this book, it felt like he was doing this nose to nose. And he said, schmuck, wake up. To be a genius, it's not enough to come up with a theory that only seven men in the world can understand. To be a genius, you have to be able to come up with that theory and then express it so clearly that anyone with a high school education and a reasonable degree of intelligence can understand it. So Albert Einstein, when I was 12 years old, a man I never met, gave me a mission, and that is be a writer. Don't just be any writer. Be a writer who makes things so clear, so delicious, so cliffhanging, that people can't stop reading it, that it's like candy for the mind. Mm. Um, and so, so when I fail to get across the first things precipitating from, from that sheet of space and time, made of nothing but space and time, these first things are made of nothing but space and time. Um, and if I can't get that across, I have to go back to the workshop and work on some better metaphors. <laughs> oh, no. I don't, I don't mean for you to go back and redo, revisit your work. Uh, I will say that English is my third language, and I grew up in South America. Oh, that's America. right. You grew up in South America, so right? So maybe it's 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 definitely me. It's not you. It's me. <laughs> I don't think so. No. Uh, the but one you're just thing talking about quarks also, raining down, right? Yeah. Go ahead. That's yes, what you're quarks. saying. It's quarks raining down, and that's basically what you're talking about. I was just trying to grasp the metaphor, like what exactly was raining down. Those were quarks. Well, think of them as little triangles. Little triangles. Because because it turns out that quarks cannot live on their own. It turns out that from the moment those first quarks came raining from the nothingness, from space, time, and speed, they were born with social instincts. It's like they had a little Emily Post etiquette book built into their fiber. Oh, they, I know what you're saying. Okay, sorry to interrupt. But you're saying that the Big Bang happened, and out of that sheet came the quarks raining down. Meaning they weren't right. there before, but right. after the Big Bang drops <laughs> they self-assembled somehow out of space time and speed nothing but space time and speed now imagine them as little triangles and the reason for imagining them that is they cannot live on their own they must they can only survive in groups so instantly they glom up into groups of two and three and the groups with two up triangles and one down triangle those are protons and the groups with two up triangles and one down, well, whatever it is, the opposite group. Those are neutrons. And so at the very beginning of the universe, in addition to the fact that this universe is not doing anything entropic, it is not running down, it is not becoming a random soup, it is becoming so unrandom and inventive that it's ridiculous, you have the birth of sociality. The birth of sociality. And almost all of our sciences oh. treat things as if they live in isolation. And from the very beginning, the very first things could not live in isolation. They had oh. to be social to survive. So we are, re we are misconceiving our cosmos until we get the fact that it is violently, it's in favor of violent upheavals of creativity, breakthroughs, innovations, and it does what it does through individuals coming together in groups, in other words, sociality and communication. Because how do those quarks get together? They interpret 
their attraction and repulsion cues. What's that all about? That's called information exchange. That's called communication. There is sociality and communication at the very first flick of the fucking cosmos. I love that. (laughs) I love that. That's crazy. Now, you're not the only one that's – this isn't just your theory, is it? I mean, there's – or is Well, unfortunately, I mean, it's in my book, The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates, and James Burke, the creator of the Connection series for the PBS and BBC, says it's the most thrilling cliffhanger of a book he can ever remember reading. Yes, at the moment, I'm alone in this. You would think that it would be obvious to everybody in science, but for some reason, they're – they're – they are held in this religion of the second law of thermodynamics and entropy, and I can't get them out of it. No matter how hard I, I no matter how I explain the facts to them, the facts don't matter. Do you think it's They're, the books that they've published and they're going to be losing money if they have to change a paradigm or the, the thought no, process? No, I think it's something, it's something deeper than that. Um, to, there are initiation rituals to most groups. And, one great initiation ritual is to be able to believe in three impossible things before breakfast. Uh, that's, that's from, I think the red queen or the white queen or something like that in Alice in Wonderland. And, um, you have to show your intelligence in the community of scientists by pretending that you not only, uh, understand the second law of thermodynamics, but you believe in it. It's a rite of passage. And once you've gone through that rite of passage, you want everybody to go through that rite of passage um, in order to get into your group. So it's a religion. The Mm. second law of thermodynamics is a dogma. Um, It is like the dogmas of the Catholic Church, and it has nothing to do with science. And scientifically, it is dead wrong. It is the very opposite of reality. And the job in science is to come up with hypotheses, compare them to reality, and if reality doesn't fit your hypotheses, discard the hypotheses and come up with new ones. But with the second law of thermodynamics, no, it's sacred. What are the consequences of getting rid of the second law of thermodynamics? Well, the consequences are that you look in the universe in a very different way. You look at what mankind is doing and changing the face of this planet in a different way. You realize that life itself in the four billion years that it's been around is just a very, very thin skin on the face of the planet you realize that we're not running out of resources, for example. For every ounce of living stuff, not just human stuff, living stuff on this planet, there are 120 million ounces of dead stuff waiting to be kidnapped, seduced, and recruited into the process of life. Now, we don't get that. You know, we are busy thinking entropically that all things fall apart, and so our civilization must be falling apart, and we must be destroying the planet, and we must be raping the place. Well, look, we share the planet with our first four mothers, bacteria. And they are as good as we are at research and development, which is why our drug industry is in a constant race with bacteria. Um, And bacteria right now, two miles beneath your feet and mine, two miles beneath your feet in Boise, there are bacteria eating granite, eating basalt, eating raw rock, and turning it into bio stuff, bringing it into this grand enterprise of life. Now, if we think we are smarter than bacteria, why do they understand that the resources are endless? That they're just beneath our feet, that it's just a matter of inventing a way to use them. If they're, we're so bright, why are they the pioneers of taking all this raw stuff beneath our feet and turning it into part of the bio project? The greening of, the, of this, look, this is a poison pebble of a planet. It always has been. It is the home of climate catastrophe. It has been the home to snowball Earth, in which the ice uh, on the face of the, the planet was a mile to six miles thick. Can you imagine that? The interglacial like to... period? Is that what it was no, called? No, this, be- this is worse than a glacial period because it was frozen right down to the equator. It was about, I think, uh, 600 uh, million years ago, and there may have been an earlier uh, ice ball Earth. But think of the very beginning of the Earth. Here's this ball of stone um, circling around a mid-sized star. And a star is an inferno. A star is a hell. You have all the elements of hell here because this little pebble circling, this poison pill of a planet, is circling around its axis every six hours. That means for three hours, one side of the planet is in this toxic stuff 
called radiation, light. And for the next three hours, it's in this toxic, equally toxic environment called darkness. And then it's back again every three hours, back and forth. Every three hours, the temperature goes up 88 degrees when you're in the sun and plunges 88 degrees when you're in the darkness. Plus, there's a tilt to the axis of this poison pill of stone. And because of that tilt, there are massive climate changes that take place every single year. They're called summer, winter, fall, and spring. This is not a good environment for life. This is an extraordinarily hostile environment. It is the mother of catastrophe. It is the mother of climate change. And yet life took hold on this planet and look what it's done in the 4 billion years since then. Now, if you take a, a, a plane trip from New York to Boise, and once you get, if you're going west, once you get past Pennsylvania, the earth is brown. There's lots and lots of desert. There's lots of stuff that doesn't seem to contain any life at all. That's open opportunity for life. That just shows you how thin the coating of life is, despite four billion years. And for life, life has been imperialistic, colonialistic, and materialistic. Its task, again, is to kidnap and seduce as many dead atoms as possible and recruit them into the process of life, into gardening the solar system and greening the galaxy. Um, and yet life, for all of this ambition, for all of this drive, for all of this imperialism and colonialism, taking new territory all the time and battling over old territory, life is still just the thinnest little incrustation on the, on the thinnest part of the planet, the face between the atmosphere and, and the stone the earth once was. And what's worse, material, look at materialism and consumerism. We, the, what is the name we've given to this planet? Earth. You know where that name comes from? Once upon a time, there was barren stone. And bacteria and later earthworms started eating the stone. And then they shat out what they couldn't absorb. And their shit, we call it soil because it's soiled. You know, it's dirty, right? Mm. It's, it's shit. It's fecal material. Um, it's garbage. It's, it's uh, sewage. That sewage is what we call the earth. Pick a, you pick a handful of it up sometime. We regard it as the most fertile thing on the face of the planet and precious and rare and endangered. But it's all shit. It's all garbage. It's all the result of a bunch of imperialistic, colonialist, materialist, earthworms and bacteria taking more raw material stuff and churning it into the process of life. So God, and we don't. That's crazy. I mean, the, the similar thing, the first thing that came up was Cyclone B, which is. Yeah. It, it, which, the gas that was used in the ovens in Germany. Correct. And then the guy who invented that got a Nobel Peace Prize for finding out a way to extract nitrogen from the air. Exactly. And he increased the potential of humanity to live on this planet. He must have doubled or tripled it. Um, what he did was amazing. Um, same deal. And, same deal, though, right? Same parallel? Well, yes, unfortunately, because, you know, I'm Jewish and Zionist and atheist and all of that stuff. So I would have been one of the first in the ovens if I'd been in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, so it's a, it's a frightening thought. But yes, any tool, any hammer can be used to build a house or it can be used to kill. Many people with, current, with our current uh, uh, scientific ethics movement would ban the hammer from the beginning. If they'd ban the hammer from the beginning, how many homes do you? Because it can be used to kill. They don't look at the fact that the same tool that can be used to kill can be used to build. Jesus, you don't outlaw a fork because it makes people fat. That's right. Or you don't outlaw a fork because you could kill somebody with it. Well, you could if yeah. you wanted to. Yeah. Um, not so, me. I'm not coordinated enough. I'm probably dropping. But you look, at, okay. you, look at the, you look at the positive products of the new technologies you invent, and you look for their negatives. And those negatives that do harm to other people, you try to outlaw, unless you're uh, Donald Trump, in which case he's just said, oh, it's perfectly legal um, to screw people. Um, but, but he got where he is by screwing people, so what does he know? But, it, but there's a positive side to everything. Every poison is an opportunity waiting for its discoverer. Every peril is an opportunity waiting for its discovery. Every... Every form of shit, fecal matter, and waste 
is a form of fuel, just waiting for its moment of discovery, waiting for the discovery of the way to utilize it. Or we, if it weren't that case, we wouldn't have called this place Earth because that's the equivalent of calling it shit. <laughs> but that means we should celebrate shit for its potential, not uh, deride it and degrade it for its negatives. Now, I would call you a philosopher, but you, in, you started out in science at the age of 10. You said that story about when you were 12 in school and then understanding relativity to the point where I'm 31 and I still don't understand as much as you did when you were 10. And you, you made your money doing something completely different though. Completely you different. Let's go, let's go over those early credentials a little bit more. So when I was 12, I built my first Boolean algebra machine. That's a symbolic logic machine. It was called a computer, but it wasn't really, uh, uh, it wasn't binary. Um, when I was 12, my mom dragged me off to the University of Buffalo to meet with the head of the graduate physics department, not the undergraduate physics department, the graduate physics department. And, you know, if you were the head of the graduate physics department and a 12 year old was being schlepped to your office, you'd want to get that kid out of your office and out of your office in five minutes so you could get back to real work. We ended up discussing, we ended up in his office for an hour. We were in his office for an hour because 1954 was the year when the guy behind steady state theory of cosmology, Fred Hoyle, was absolutely convinced that he was about to defeat his rival, George Gamow, who was the backer of the Big Bang Theory of the Universe, and that that year, Big Bang Theory would die and no one would ever remember it. Hmm. Was Fred Hoyle right? At any rate, so that was the biggest controversy in cosmology at the time, and that's what we were debating for an hour with a 12-year-old. And then he walked out and he towered over me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, you don't have to save for grad school for him. He'll get fellowships in theoretical physics at any university in the country he wants. That's when I was fucking 12. And when I was 16, <laughs> didn't make the kids like me, believe you. Oh, believe fuck me. those kids. What are they at today? Yeah. But And then when I was 16, I went to work as a lab assistant at the world's largest cancer research facility, the Roswell Park Memorial Cancer Research Center. And I was bored with the work that we were doing, which was on the immune system. Mm. And instead, I was pondering a problem. It's called the CPT problem. If matter and antimatter are created in equal amounts at the same time, why is there so much matter in this universe and so little antimatter? And I solved that problem. And I came up with toroidal theory of the universe, the big bagel which you can look up on YouTube. It's a five and a half minute video. It's fascinating. And what you'll discover is this theory, David, predicted something we now call dark energy that wouldn't be discovered for another 38 years. It predicted dark energy. Dark energy is one of the biggest puzzles in, in physics and cosmology today. And this theory explains it. Not that anybody's going to pay any attention because I ended up passing on all my university and all my, my grad school fellowships. So I don't have the credentials. Nobody's, I, I got a different set of credentials. I got real life credentials instead. So yeah, that's my scientific background. How and did you get bored really of from. particle physics and go into being a, a publicist? Well, remember at the age of, uh, thir well, the age of 13, I suddenly about, uh, I suddenly at the age of 12 realized I was an atheist, but refused to acknowledge it. You know, sometimes you can tuck something in the side of your brain and keep it away from your center of attention and pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> so, I was forced to go to a Christian high school. Uh -huh. Well, I, I kept this a secret to myself because I had my bar mitzvah coming up and I was going to get presents and there was going to be a party and I was actually going to be invited, which was something utterly new to me. And I didn't want to blow it. So I waited until after my bar mitzvah, and then I confessed that I was an atheist, and I got thrown out of confirmation class by the rabbi. And, um, and then my parents, very, very soon after I made this confession, the high holidays came up, Rosh Hashanah and, and Yom Kippur. Well, my parents were not observant, but to them, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur were absolutely sacred. You absolutely had to go. So they got me dressed in a suit. I don't know how they did it, and because I hate suits. And they got me into their car and they got me all the way over to Richmond Avenue, which is where the temple was. And then I refused to go any further. So I was hanging on to the frame of, you know, the sturdy American made steel frame of the door 
Well, my parents were trying to drag me by the ankles, and I had a realization. The two guys who inspired me in science were Galileo and Anton von Leeuwenhoek. And Galileo had taken a device that was used to see an enemy coming over the horizon called the telescope, and he dared turn it in a totally unexpected direction from here horizontally, here vertically, to look at the sky. Now look, that was utterly pointless. Everybody knew what was in the sky. It was perfect Aristotelian circles, perfect spheres with perfect little spherical planets uh, and stars on them. Of course, that's not what Galileo discovered. He discovered that they looked like craggy stones and began modern science. Um, and Anton von Leeuwenhoek took the same high-tech device, the lens, and he was a draper. So he was using the lens to see how fine the weave was of the fabrics he was importing and made a big decision. He decided instead of pointing it this way, to point it this way. And he looked at pond water and he, he, he saw the first microorganisms, the first self-propelled little beasts, animalcules, he called them. And then he was even more courageous. He looked at human sperm, fresh human sperm, and discovered animalcules in that and had the audacity to write to the Royal Society about it. Now, why did it take audacity and courage? Where do you think he got her human sperm? I mean, it took me 30 years to figure this out. <laughs> Self-donated. Yeah, so, so these guys had innovated by changing the direction of the lens. And when my parents were yanking at my ankles, trying to get me to temple, I had a sudden realization. There are no gods in the sky. There are no gods under the earth. There are no gods. And yet there's a presence of a God here so powerful that my parents are willing to shred my socks, leave me shoeless, and drag me shoeless to the temple. Um, the gods are inside of us. The gods are inside my parents. The gods are inside of you and me. And so one of my missions, scientifically, in life, became to find the gods inside of us. And I realized that Adolf Hitler, a man who changed history, had changed history by being an incredible artist in taking the gods inside of you and the gods inside of me and making them pixels in a seething mass, a big picture, a historical movement. And that that's, that's the forces of history, those gods inside of us. Um, so I've been chasing those gods inside of us my whole life. And when I had four fellowships to grad school, you know, I graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa after dropping out for three years and accidentally helping start the hippie movement. And that's in my book, How I Accidentally Started the 60s, which will come out around August. Oh, um, and I want that uh, book so bad. <laughs> well, 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 remind me, I'll get you a copy. So at any rate, um, I had these four grad school fellowships. It was in a field that didn't quite exist yet. Today it's called cognitive neuro, uh, neuroscience, and, but it didn't really exist. I was going to have to put it together myself in grad school. And I realized, hey, I'm, I'm going into a field that's in psychology, which means I'm going to spend the rest of my life giving paper and pencil tests to 22 college students in exchange for a psychology credit. Am I ever going to see the kind of extraordinary passion that Hitler's uh, torchlight parades evoked, that absolutely ecstatic sensibility that he evoked in his people? Am I ever going to find the forces of history? Am I ever going to find the gods inside of us? I'm not going to be allowed anywhere near any of that. And so I started to wander in a field that no one had ever allowed me in before. I had no knowledge of it, popular culture, because I'd listened to Rachmaninoff and Beethoven and Bartok and Stravinsky um, during my childhood. I hadn't listened to popular music. My mom, in fact, was in agony one year because she was basically saying, why won't he listen to Elvis? Mm. She was listening to Elvis. She wanted to be, me, me to be like other kids. So I got a chance to go into pop culture, and I ended up founding the biggest PR firm in the music industry because I used my tools of science to figure things out. I saw that there were traditional ways of doing things, and if they were effective, I was willing to use them. But if they were ineffective, screw you. I wasn't bound to the traditions of the pop music industry. I'm from science. I'm from another planet. <laughs> so, so I used my science to figure out what worked and what didn't work. And the result was taking unknown figures like Joan Jett and Prince and making superstars out of them. They deserved to be superstars. Yes. They had deserved it all along. Yes. But it took 
it took seeing things through the lens of Martin Gardner's Scientific American Mathematical Games section to to get them where they where they deserve to go. And to do it in a way, I mean, the first thing I realized about music was that it's not about an exchange of pieces of plastic. It's not about a download. It's not about marketing. It's not about branding. Um, it's, it, it's not about product. All those words are dehumanizing. It's a business, a fucking goddamn human soul. It's, a, it's an artist on stage being utterly taken over by the deepest soul inside of him and communicating it to an audience whose souls are then aroused in sympathy and harmony and who feed that soul energy back to the audience. It's a goddamn soul exchange. So if you came into my office and you said you wanted to work with me, I gave you a speech. And I said, if you expect me to confabulate an image, an artificial mask for you, that, and then swear that that will make you a star, you're in the wrong place and I'll get you an appointment immediately with my best competitor. Who will do that for you? If you're going to work with me, you have to understand music is about human soul. When you go on a stage and have a really good night with your audience and have, a, have an out-of-body experience and it feels like something you've never seen before is dancing you like a marionette on stage, taking the energy of the audience that flows through you, transmogrifying it utterly and completely, and then channeling it back, back down to the audience in a reverberatory circuit. That's your fucking soul. When you sit in front of a blank screen and have to write a lyric and know you can never write another lyric again in your life and wonder how you ever wrote a lyric to begin with, and two hours later there's a lyric on that screen in front of you, that's your fucking soul talking on a really good day. My job is to find the soul inside of you and introduce it to the self that knows how to say, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you very much, and do the rituals of everyday life. Because by staying true to your soul, you will stay true to your audience. If you stay true to your soul, not just in your teens and your 20s, but in your 30s, your 40s, and your 50s, you will always be a reflection. You will always be a mirror. You will always be a consolidating force for the identity, for the lost identity of your audience. So you hire me, you're hiring a secular shaman who's going to get to the very fucking bottom of you. If you're willing to go through that, I'll work with you. I'm willing. Take me through it. <laughs> All I know how to do is spin records, though. Spin records and write blogs about my past. <laughs> right. Well, so that's what I used to do. And, and why? Because when I was 14, you know, after having discovered that one of my missions was to find the gods inside, um, I heard about a book called The Varieties of the Religious Experience by a guy named William James. And in those days, we had no Amazon. And it was Buffalo, New York, for God's sakes, a wasteland when it comes to books. So it took me six months to find a copy of the book. But when I read that book, he laid out a series of ecstatic experiences. And I, first of all, I felt I needed to experience those things, that I needed to do what my friend Robin Fox, the founder of the Anthropology Department of Workers University, he calls it participant observer science. I needed to feel those ecstasies in order to understand those ecstasies, in order to explain where those ecstasies fit into the big picture from a scientific point of view. And it felt like William James had very little in the way of an explanatory mechanism, but had left seven major instances of the ecstatic experience on a lab table, hoping that someone like me would come along 57 years later and would apply the new science of a later time to those ecstatic experiences. And that's what I was doing in the world of rock and roll, as strange as that sounds. Oh, and that's wow. what I'm doing in the Muhammad Code. I'm trying to get in. I'm trying to put you in the very brain, the very mind of Muhammad and the very mind of a suicide bomber so that you see and feel and, 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 and emote the world in a whole different way so that suicide bombings no longer are a mystery to you. And you, because they're a threat to the civilization that nurtures you and me in the conversation we're having at this moment, we know how to stop them. We can't do it. Sun Tzu, you know, the great Chinese strategist from roughly 200 BC, Sun Tzu says to defeat an enemy, you must be able to walk in his shoes. To defeat an enemy, you must be able to be your enemy. That needs to be your second personality. And, and that's an exploration of the gods inside of us too. If you can't do that, how are you going to understand the gods inside of us? If you can't 
put yourself into the mind and emotions of a suicide bomber. What do you really know? Not very much. What do you know about history? Not much, because the Islamic empire conquered a territory 11 times the size of the conquests of Alexander the Great, five times the size of the Roman Empire, and seven times the size of the United States. Now, if that's not a significant historical achievement, and if we don't understand it, then we don't understand history. Mm. And here I am scientifically expeditioning into the forces of history. Tonight I go on coast to coast to talk about why we're all so depressed this week. Well, I've been talking on coast to coast about the problems with North Korea. Last week, coast, I, I had done five interviews with Iranian television on five different topics. From the Trappist-1 solar system, you know, this distant star 40 million light years away from us that has seven Earth-like planets rotating around it. Right. From that to why the Saudis have so much influence in the United States and, and Iran doesn't. Um, and, and whether there are aliens all kinds of topics. And then I had done my podcast, which is about something utterly different, which I do in a studio near Times Square. And I was walking through Times Square, which is my treat to myself mm. once a week. And I, the phone rang and it was my producer from coast to coast, the highest rated overnight talk radio show in North America. It's on 500 radio stations. And my producer, we have very short conversations. They always go like this, Tom, you need me? Yes. The topic and he said, Korea and China. And I said, no, Tom, Korea, China, and Syria. This was at 7.40 p.m. at night. At 8.40 p.m., an hour later, do you know what happened in Syria? We launched 59 Tomahawk missiles. Mm -hmm. so, so I have to explain why we're all so depressed this week in terms of these international affairs, because that's what's depressing me. Um, it's just how little we can really do about Korea and how Putin is eating our ass um, in the Middle East. Mm. So uh, does this have anything to do with finding the gods inside and seeing them in the grand context from a scientific point of view? You bet your ass. This is the raw stuff that science has to deal with. This is where the gods inside are coming to life in the world today. Does that make any sense? It absolutely does. You're saying the gods inside are... It's something that if you can bring out the gods inside to make people act something out, it's control. It, you could control a population. You could have something. Is that what you're saying? Yes, but not all control is bad control. Um, Hitler managed to rouse his population to ecstatic levels um, and thus get a tremendous loyalty and put them together into a title. And then Winston Churchill and FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, had to do the same thing, but they had to do it on behalf of what I would consider to be good, not evil, mm. um, by rousing us to defend our own civilization. They protected a civilization that's the only civilization that has ever allowed people like you and me to have conversations like this and has ever allowed 350 years of cumulative scientific knowledge to which I'm trying to contribute. So how do we change, how do we change the world for the better? It was, according to Howard Bloom, what are the steps that we need to take in order to advance society, advance culture, advance advance the the sapiens spinning around the star that is the sun on this? Uh, how, how did you put it? This death planet or this lead We're trap? This planet of catastrophe, oh, yeah. the, uh, the planet of climate disaster. Um, these earbuds keep falling out. So this is a very good question. First, we have to recognize the value of our civilization. Let's go back to those people who used to walk in here saying Western civilization is dying and it deserves to die. No, I'm sorry, that's not true. If you'd been born in, born in Western civilization in 1850, your life expectancy would have been 38.5 years. If you were born in Western civilization in the year 2000, your life expectancy was 78.5 years. That is more than doubling the human lifespan. That's 40 extra years on the human lifespan. No civilization in the history of mankind has ever done anything like it. The Chinese, for all of their sophistication, all of their technologies, and believe me, they invented things that would astonish you, like gunpowder and the rocket and the cannon um, and a whole bunch of, I mean, they had rooms in which you walked into the room and the, the, the Venetian blinds went up automatically. Oh. The emperor was the only one who had that kind of thing, but nonetheless, they had them. Um, 
for all of their astonishments, the emperor would be willing to spend half of everything he possessed just to get an extra four years of life. And the emperors were constantly hiring alchemists to give them extra life. And usually the alchemist's formula killed the emperor earlier than he would have been killed otherwise. So adding 40 years to the human lifespan is astonishing. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you took an average group of kids off the street um, any time this year, and you gave them a Stanford Binet IQ test from 1915, the first Stanford Binet IQ test, the average IQ of those kids who we've been told have been shallowed and dumbed down by Facebook and the internet, the average IQ of those kids would have been marginal genius. The average IQ would have been 135. We've added 35 extra IQ points to the average kid in 102 years. Mm. That's astonishing. Um, if you took the poorest paid worker in London in 2000 and compared her salary to the salary of the poorest paid worker in London in 1850, she earned what an entire tenement full of workers earned, the equivalent. Not counting things like antibiotics. It was a stomach ailment that killed Prince, uh, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, who was the biggest techno geek you have ever seen. He loved technology, and yet he died in his early 40s because, because penicillin and antibiotics did not yet exist. That's crazy. Even homeless people have, asked, have access to emergency rooms and antibiotics these days. Um, the, uh, and then there's the factor of peace. I mean, we've, oh, plus, we've gained four inches in height in the last 150 years. Um, and peace has gone up by a factor of 10. These are bloody fucking astonishments. If we don't recognize them, we don't know the value of our society, and we don't know why it's worth defending it. We don't know why it's worth defending it. Point number two from my book, The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism. This Western civilization that gives us this benefits operates on three things working in balance with each other the way you balance on a bicycle. Um, one of them is government, which gives us roads, the internet, all kinds of things, bridges. Um, the second is private industry, which gives us Apple and Google once the government has invented the internet and the microchip. Um, and the third is the protest industry, which has been around as long as this country has been around. And the protest industry is a mass marketing industry it has used pamphleteering, the printing press, the newspaper, the radio, the television, and being able to jet set from one location to another to throw rallies and being able to jet set around wearing Nikes uh, that make your feet much more comfortable so that your brain power is not spent maintaining your feet, but is spent maintaining your brain. Unfortunately, most of the movements right now think Western civilization is shit and that it should be discarded, want to dismantle all of our technologies, and don't recognize these incredible achievements that are giving these movements the grounds for existence. We have to continue. We have to make sure we don't uh, poison the planet. We have to make sure that we don't poison each other. Um, but we have, to, we have to cut this fucking bullshit of saying that we are the worst thing that ever happened to this planet and we are raping the planet. No, not all forms of copulation are rape. And this is a copulation. And nature has worked with copulations for 13.7 billion years. And she isn't going to stop because we have a bunch of stupid intellectuals who have totally misconceived science, the planet, and their role in the cosmos. Howard Bloom, ladies and gentlemen, blowing my mind. This is fascinating. This is all fascinating stuff. You may be, no, you may be my new favorite person. I'm going to go on Amazon, start buying some books, start reading up. The book, The Muhammad Code, is out currently. Right. It's The Muhammad Code. I was a Desert Prophet brought you ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Boko Haram, or how Muhammad invented jihad. In August, there will be how I accidentally started the 60s. Woo! Uh, yes. <laughs> and then to, to read up on the stuff that I've been talking about, Grab the Lucifer Principle, A Scientific Expedition into the Forces of History, my first book, which is still selling strong. And, and take a look at the God problem, how a godless cosmos creates. And if you get really inspired, take a look at, I mean, Global Brain 
the office of the Secretary of Defense through a forum based on my second book, Global Brain, and brought in people from uh, the State Department, the Energy Department, DARPA, IBM, and MIT. And the third book, The Genius of the Beast, A Radical Revision of Capitalism, the sheik who made Dubai what it is today and who doubles, he not only rules the United, he not only rules Dubai, he's the prime minister of the United Arab Emirates, named a racehorse after that book. And I'm a Zionist atheist Jew. And this guy's a Muslim. <laughs> yeah. So. That, listen, Howard, I, I sincerely appreciate you coming on here to the Cybrink uh, podcast, YouTube channel. Uh, this is just all amazing stuff, and again, I, I, I repeat myself because I don't have that high IQ like those 12-year-olds you're saying you're pulling off the street. I have taken an IQ test. It's not very – it's not worth sharing. How about that? <laughs> well, to me, you seem as intelligent as can be. I'm enjoying this tremendously. I, I'm just curious, and you're, you're a fascinating cat, and I just I, – I enjoyed the shit out of talking to you today, and uh, I hope we could do it again. Uh, if you have any updates, just please let us know, written or otherwise, or just hit record on that voice memo button on your phone, then we'll we'll publish it for you. Or you can just record yourself in a video, and we'll we'll get the word out for you. Oh, just very neat. Nothing but fascinating stuff. Uh, I look forward to your work. And save some room in the gas tank so you can maybe try and crack the code of uh, how those uh, – how the Sphinx, or how the, not the Sphinx, but the, uh, the, pyramids. the pyramids got there. Because right. I'm racking my brain on that one, but I'm the wrong guy to think about that. <laughs> Me too. I can't construct anything to save my life. Oh, uh, nonsense. But the theories are fascinating nonetheless. Howard Bloom, ladies and gentlemen, where can people get a hold of you and find you? Uh, it's howardbloom.net um, is the website. Uh, there's a, a podcast called uh, Howard Bloom Saves the Universe. And that's on iTunes. And uh, there's my, uh, you just Google Howard Bloom and you'll see my own, uh, whatever it's called, YouTube episode site. So, but the best place is read the books. Read, read the, books. the books. Read yeah. the books. I'm, I, I'm all code. about it. And when is uh, the, the possible release date for how you accidentally created the 60s? Yeah, that seems to be around August. Uh, we're still making up our mind about that. The publisher is going to get back to me tomorrow. Ooh, just do it before September so it can release right near my birthday. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, well, that'd David, be great. It's, been, it's been a it's been a pleasure. It's been refreshing. It's been refreshing. You have this very great. Yeah, you you've done exactly what you set out to do, which is explain things in a way that some dummy like me can just understand it. And I sincerely appreciate that because that is not something that it may sound easy, but I know the amount of work that you've spent into it. Actually, I don't know, but I can only assume the amount of work that you've put into it. And I appreciate that. But it's been huge fun, and I'm glad that <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's what counts. That's what really, you know, people like me live for. Keep going, Howard. Keep going, Howard Bloom. You keep doing amazing things, and I just uh, I w we'll keep following what you're doing over at Cybrink.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Howard Bloom. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, David. Have a great night. <laughs>